Okay, so what we're going to cover here is we're going to talk about using the parallel streams approach to improve the performance of the search stream gang. So as you'll see, we had run the sequential version before, and it took a certain amount of time. And now we're going to talk about the parallel streams version. It's going to take much, much faster or much lower time to run than the parallel version. And then I'll talk about the pros and cons for this approach. So we're going to focus on two methods, just like we did with the sequential version, process stream and process input. And uh, as you can see, that's what the methods do. And we're going to focus on map and filter and collect primarily to see how those things work. The method process stream uses a parallel stream to search a list of input strings in parallel. So it's going to take the input strings and it'll run uh, the input strings will be run in parallel, and it'll call this method called process input for each string. And the process input method is going to use a parallel stream to search the search phrases in parallel. So we're going to have a number of things going on in parallel at the same time. So let's start by kind of showing you a quick visualization. This will look familiar because we talked about the sequential version of this before, but I'll compare and contrast it, hopefully visually, to show you what's different when we do the parallel version. So it starts out by having a list of input phrases. We're just going to focus on the, uh, this is the, uh, this is visualizing how this thing works for search phrases. We have a list of input phrases to find. And when we call parallel stream, that's going to end up basically partitioning the input by using a splitterator up into multiple substreams, which are chunks of the input that are processed, chunks of phrases or chunks of input strings that are going to be processed in parallel. That ends up with an output stream of phrases to find. And notice the key thing to, to differentiate this from the sequential version we looked at before is that the sequential version ran everything in one thread of control, whereas this version is going to run some of the chunks in one thread and some of the chunks in another. Now, just to make this diagram relatively easy to understand, I have two threads. But keep in mind that the number of threads in practice is really a function of the number of cores that you have on your machine. So if you have a dual core machine, it'll probably look like this. If you have a quad core machine, it'll probably have four chunks going in parallel. So all these chunks are processed in parallel on separate threads or cores. And it's sort of an implementation decision how big each chunk is. Then what happens is the, the stream of phrases to find is piped into the map portion. Map will search for the phrases in each input string in parallel. So these guys will run in parallel to those guys. So that's what's different from the sequential version. That outputs a stream of search results. We turn around and run that through uh, a filter operation, which will look for the input phrases in the strings in parallel. All right, So you kind of get a consistent theme here. We're doing the same thing we did with the sequential version, except now we're doing it in parallel for everything. So it's good. these guys are going to run in parallel for those guys. And that'll then produce an output, which is again fed as the input into collect. And collect will now go ahead and trigger the intermediate operation. So that's actually where the computations get done. Everything else is just setting up the stage for doing this. And then the processing will all run on the multiple threads and the multiple cores. And then the results will be joined back together in the originating thread. I'll talk about that in a second because that's important to understand. The originating thread is going to put it all back together again based on the so-called encounter order. So if the phrase is, you know, let, let's go back to musical notes. It's easier to think about. If the phrases were, you know, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, you know, the, the names of the musical notes, then after we've searched everything and we filtered out the stuff that wasn't there, the, the names that are given back where we have search results will basically be, you know, do, re, mi, fa, sa, you know, it'll be the same order because the default behavior, unless you futz around with it, is going to give you back the results in the so-called encounter order. So if we encounter the phrases in some order, the computations will all run independently in, in whatever non-deterministic order that's most efficient, but the results will be put back in so-called encounter order. If you don't like that, you can just give a flag that says unordered, and it'll give them back in some non-deterministic order. Any questions about that? So that's kind of what's going on under the hood from a visualization point of view. 
should look very familiar. The only difference is that now things are going to run in parallel. Keep in mind also, just to reiterate this point from earlier, the actual behavior is not quite the same way as the visualization. It's, it's actually goes, um, each input source is run through all the processing operations, and that's what is happening. So it doesn't go you know, line by line, it goes top to bottom. But it's easier to think about it, typically, if you think about it sort of going in this other order. All right, so now that we've seen the visualization, let's look at the code. It turns out the code is absurdly the same as the original code with one tiny difference. Uh, the process stream method has one minuscule, one atomic little difference. Instead of saying dot stream here, it says dot parallel stream. So, boom, all of a sudden we're searching input in parallel. Uh, this code here, which is calling process input, will run in parallel. Uh, looking for the phrases, and under the hood, of course, this is going to be using a splitterator to split things up into chunks, so those things will be running in parallel. And the input strings are decomposed by the splitterator that's called for the parallel stream factory method, and those input strings are, are subdivided up into these sub-input string chunks, and then those things are fed into the fork join pool to be processed in parallel. So the chunks of input strings are processed in parallel in the common fork join pool. Um, so, and that's all there is to it, right? Really, really simple. Likewise, process input is also ridiculously simple. Um, you say parallel stream instead of stream. Wow, that was a big change. And then all of a sudden, the phrases are also looked up in parallel in addition to the strings being looked up in parallel. And here we have a call to search for phrase. We'll look at this in more detail later. We looked at it earlier when we were talking about splitterators in the sequential version. And the key thing to note here is this is going to search for a given phrase in a given input string on, uh, under a given title like Hamlet or Macbeth or whatnot. And by passing in the value false here, that says don't search for the phrase, don't take the input string itself and further decompose it in parallel. Take each input string and search for a phrase in that input string in parallel with the other phrases that are being searched for, but we don't break the input string up into chunks. So that passing in false says don't splitterate them in parallel. We'll come back and relax that restriction in just a second. So once again, phrases are now split up and those things are given to the fork join pool and those things are run in parallel as well. So chunks of phrases are run in parallel. Chunks of input strings are run in parallel. The only thing that isn't run in parallel are searching for a phrase in an input string. We don't further decompose the input string up into chunks and search those things. All right, so what's good about the solution? Well, probably the most useful thing that's good about this and, and the most relevant from the point of view of what you guys do in your programming assignment that'll come out next is that there's almost no difference between the sequential version and the parallel version. It's, it's ridiculously minuscule, right? You go from this to this, right? right? So stream changes to parallel stream. Wow, what's not to like? So that's one difference. And then another difference, which we'll see later, is the, um, the way in which we break the input string up into chunks using a parallel splitterator. But that won't come right away. We'll talk about that next. Even with that ridiculously small change in programming syntax, we get this, you know, n-fold speed up. That's pretty cool. That's, that's the power of declarative programming. That's the power of parallel streams. That's the power of abstraction. You do almost no work, and boom, you get a big win. So that's fantastic. So when I ran this on my quad-core Lenovo P50 that has 32 gigs of RAM, that was the speed up that I saw. Um, when I ran the same code on this computer, which is my quad core MacBook, which as you can see has a slightly faster processor, it's 2.9 gigahertz versus 2.7 gigahertz, but it only has half the RAM. Some interesting things occurred. Number one, notice how the parallel streams version, notice the number one, everything runs faster. So that clearly shows the MacBook is a faster computer than my Lenovo, so the overall performance is, is faster. So even in the sequential version, 
this one is running faster. Also notice that Parallel Streams runs faster than everything except the Parallel Splitterator version. Whereas over here, Parallel Streams was faster than Sequential Streams, but a little slower than the versions that use completable futures. And we'll come back and talk about that when we get the completable futures later. The main issue here is that completable futures have lower overhead, but they can take more, they, this particular implementation uses more memory. So of course, on a machine with lots of memory, this ran really fast. On a machine without as much memory, it was still darn fast, but it wasn't quite as fast as this version. The main point of this is just your mileage may vary, right? So you, you aren't guaranteed to get, always get the same results depending on what your input looks like, depends on how your implementation works, depending on which version of streams you're using, depending on the hardware, the memory, all those good things. Yes. Um, that's a good question. So the question is, did, did we really have to use 16 gig? Um, probably not. <laughs> Although um, we, we were searching, you know, for big phrases in the complete works of Shakespeare. So there, it was probably using all the cores. I don't know if it was using all the memory. Um, so it's, it's not really clear. Maybe, you know, another, another plausible explanation for this might be that um, even though the processor was a little slower, maybe memory access was faster. You know, who knows, right? It, it could have been a variety of things. The key thing to note is just that your mileage may vary. It doesn't always give the same results. What's the downside with this approach? And we won't, now, well, we might get a chance to talk briefly about this for the next one. Just because we did absolutely minuscule things to change the code and got a big win, doesn't mean that's always the best solution. It's probably a good starting point, you know, mind you. It's always good to get a win. But as you can see here, there are, there are other approaches that are even faster. And these other approaches required a bit more work to get extra speed. So, you know, what does that say in real life? Well, it says in real life, if you're, if you're on a project and you've got to get a speed up and you've got multi-core machines, your first line of attack may be to go from a parallel, uh, sequential stream to a parallel stream. And you may be done. Your, your customer, your boss, your teammates, whatever, may be perfectly happy, you take the rest of the day off. If they're not happy because there's something that needs to be further squeezed out for whatever reason, you have other <laughs> arrows in your quiver you can use to further optimize performance. But, you know, that may not be your starting point because there are some overheads to that. And as we said, your, your mileage may vary. So the key point there is make sure that you benchmark things and, and try to set up your code so you can do apples to apples comparisons. One of the cool things about this program is it really facilitates apples to apples comparisons. And as you can see, there's a lot more stuff we won't even talk about here, like Rx Java and so on. And, and they don't perform as well, so I don't belabor them. But under other circumstances, they might perform better. So this way, it's easy to tell which one performs best. Okay, so that's the end of the first 